knowing my luck, I'll sit down and it'll be like, oh, don't sit there. That was mom's favorite chair. We never sit there. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So I thought, oh, sweet Lord, help me. Help me. You're listening to the Nacho Kids Podcast, where we discuss all things step family related. Real stories, real people, real help. Your hosts are the creators of the Nacho Kids Method and the Nacho Kids Academy Step Family Coaching Team, Lori and David Sims. Hello, David. Hello, darling. This podcast is releasing on Christmas Eve. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Okay. <laughs> I might have to edit this more than normal, it seems. (laughs) So I was really trying to figure out what episode I wanted for this week, being it's Christmas weekend, and next week, which is New Year's weekend. I know. And I teetered back and forth, and then I said, aha, I have a podcast recording that is so wonderful, but quite long. So I'm going to break it up. I'm going to break it up. Today is going to be part one of our interview with Michelle. Michelle's husband was on our podcast, episode 84. Okay, so he was first, and so she's like, "Uh uh-uh, I got to tell my side of the story. No, that's not how it is. (laughs) I do have to say that Michelle was talking about how wonderful her husband Michael is while we were not recording. That's because it's Christmas time. What? What? It's because it's Christmas time, and she knows she's going to get something good for Christmas. She's got to say something good about him. No, because I recorded with her back in October. Uh, Well, it was Halloween, so she might get Halloween (laughs) gifts. (laughs) Well, she loves him tremendously with all of her heart, and he is absolutely fabulous. Oh. So, Michael, from here in South Carolina, we tell you how much Michelle loves you. Yes. Thank you, Michael, for raising the bar so high and making all of us other men hate you. (laughs) David. (laughs) Ah. (laughs) All right. They've been blending four and a half years. But you know, let me stop you there. You you know, if I was talking about how wonderful somebody's wife was, you'd be like, why don't you go see if you can get her in? (laughs) 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 That's how you women think. Like men, we were like, okay, cool. He's good. He's awesome. High five. Women were like, oh, you think she's so doggone good? Why don't you go try to get her in? <laughs> I didn't say he was fabulous. She did. I'm just saying. But he was a fabulous guest, and he seemed pretty awesome. That's what I'm saying, though. It's the difference in mindset between men and women when you give somebody the opposite sex a, a compliment. Okay, <laughs> let's not talk about that because you're going to make me go down a completely different road with this about men's thought processes and women's. It's and like we don't a, want to do that. Look, it's Christmas, dude. Just I mean, back even, off. Even even during Christmas, if I were to say, um, the these Christmas cookies that so and so made are fantastic. If you like your Christmas cookies, they're good. <laughs> That's not true. You you must Especially, be having flashbacks from your past wife. Yeah, yeah. Your wife um, of Christmas past. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's uh, it's funny how that that is. And and us men, you know, we're tiptoeing around things and going, "Ooh, tell you what, what a minefield it is." <laughs> All right, David, I think you need to speak to somebody. <laughs> um, I can refer you to a counselor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still dealing with uh, uh, past regressive feelings uh, from the previous marriage. You're, you're right. You're uh-huh. right. It's like trauma. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of emotional abuse happening. Okay, let's not talk about this. <laughs> it's a happy season. It's Christmas. I am. I'm happy that I'm done with that. <laughs> well, I hope you're done with that. Are you done talking about that, or do I'm we done. need to find you a I'm therapist? Done. Th- thank you for my therapy session, honey. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> All right, back to Michelle. I don't know why you can get off on a tangent. Yeah, I don't know either. Okay, so again, they've been blending four and a half years. She has a stepdaughter, 25, stepson, 24, stepson, 18, and two adult stepkids that they don't really have a relationship in Texas. And she has a bio son, 16. Ooh. 
Stepson 24 and stepson 18 live in the home. Uh Uh-oh, don't tell people that. All these people thinking they're going to be out when they're 18. David, this is not the negative Nelly show. (laughs) Yeah, but for all these people that have the countdown timers on their phones to 18, you're you're bursting their bubble. Okay, well, by a mom is deceased. Well, that uh, adds a lot of complexity to the situation. Yes, I figured that would get you back on track. (laughs) And her dear husband, Michael, was a pastor. Oh, man. So pastor's kids? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Okay. Let's not divulge too much, but this is part one. And I will say I probably laugh a little too much in this podcast because she is freaking hilarious. (laughs) So she is bringing you some holiday cheer is what she's going to do. Yeah, just like I did. No, David. (laughs) Speaking of holiday cheer, we have to announce the winner of the Nacho Kids Academy Sylvia Crack Hour Scholarship. Well, let's get it done. Da, 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 da. Maybe we should sing like a Christmas da, 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 da. Do it, David. A Christmas da, 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 da? Yeah. Ho, 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 ho. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not talking about his ex, y'all. Oh, well, my goodness. Maybe. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I couldn't help it. It was funny. <laughs> That's so mean. Yep. Well, that's like that bracelet I gave Jackson's girlfriend, and it says ho, ho, ho on it. And I told her that you told me to give it to her because of what it said what? on it. <laughs> what? How did I get brought into this? <laughs> okay. So the winner of the Sylvia we need to have, Crack Hour. Sh- I'm we need to have a conversation. I'm Lucy? speaking. I'm speaking. <laughs> Lucy? <laughs> Ricky, I'm talking. <laughs> Lucy? <laughs> Lucy, not here. <laughs> Lucy, you have some explaining to do. <laughs> okay. The winner of the Sylvia Crack Hour Nacho Kids Academy Scholarship is Miss Sally. Don't sing it. Don't sing it. (laughs) You knew I was about to. Don't sing it. (laughs) I don't want to hear Ride Sally Ride. Ride Sally Ride. (laughs) Or there's Mustang Sally. (sighs) Okay. I like both those songs. Or is that the same song? It might be the same song. (laughs) Okay. Whew. The eggnog got to me. I'm kidding. I don't drink eggnog. Anyway, David, anything else you want to talk to our no, lovely no, guest? No. Why are you cutting me off? There's not a delay. <laughs> I'm done with you. Told you well, not to sing Ride Sally Ride. <laughs> I wonder if that's the same as Mustang Sally. Look it up later. Not right now. Okay. I'll let y'all know at the end. I think it is. I'm sorry, Sally. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm Don't sure be sorry. Not. Sally's getting a free month of the Academy. Compliments know, of she, Sylvia Crack Hour. She's probably heard that so many times. Okay. Now she's going to have to have counseling with me about singing the song. Yeah. So me and her both will be sitting into that emotional abuse counseling sessions together. <laughs> well, at least her name's not Bonnie. <sighs> My Don't Bonnie no, lives. No. <laughs> I'm done. All right, folks. First, here's a word about the Academy, and then let's get into the interview with Michelle. And please don't sing Michelle My Bell. All right, here we go, folks. There is a way to save your sanity and your relationship, and it's called the Nacho Kids Academy. In the Nacho Kids Academy, you will learn the skills and knowledge to properly nacho, techniques to handle step family challenges, ways to improve your communication, and much, much more. Visit NachoKidsAcademy.com and sign up today to join other step parents who are seeing the life changing benefits of nachoing. Again, that's NachoKidsAcademy.com. Today we have stepmom Michelle. Hey, Michelle, how are you? Hey, I'm doing fantastic. Finer than frog hair. Finer than frog hair. Okay. You don't have to tell us what state you're in, but are you in the South? I am in the South. Because finer than frog hair is not something you hear very often. (laughs) Well, my my papa used to say that. Actually, we are in, I'm talking to you today from Tennessee, the state of Tennessee, the Great Smoky Mountains. Oh, I bet it's beautiful there now. Oh, yeah, falls fantastic here. Yes. All right. So how long have you been blending? We have been blending coming up on four and a half years of 
fanatical fun. (laughs) (laughs) I like to dream big. I was going to say, what? There's something in me that says, I don't believe you. (laughs) Oh, it's been fanatical. It just hasn't always been fun. (laughs) You just added that part in there. Yes. Frenetic. It's been all kinds of F words. Oh, yes. We'll stop there. (laughs) (laughs) So how many stepkids do you have? I have three. Well, technically I have five because my husband has two adult stepdaughters who live in Texas. And so we don't have regular contact with them. We, you know, it's more telephone and internet and social media contact. And then I have a 25 year old stepdaughter that lives in North Carolina, which is about an hour and 15 minutes from us here. Okay. And then I have stepson 24 who lives in the home with us and stepson 18 who lives in the home with us. Okay. What about bio mom? Is she in the picture? Actually, well, I think she's always, her presence is always in the picture. She physically is not in the picture. I married a widower. He was married for 18 years before his wife passed. And then we met about two years or so after she passed. Okay. So I think people have a misconception that that if you're married, someone whose spouse or partner has passed, that, oh my gosh, you don't have to deal with some of the worst parts of blending and step parenting, but that is not true. It's a big shadow. Someone who's not here casts a big shadow and leaves a big footprint. You know, I'm probably one of those before I started doing these podcasts and stuff that thought if bio mom's not in the picture, whether it's from just she's not in the picture, whether it's from death or just absence, that it would be easier. But I think after doing all these podcasts that if she's passed away, it's almost harder. Well, I I can't say that I know it's harder because I don't have any comparison. So God bless these people who have been in multiple blends. Yes. (laughs) Because I think I'd I'd rip out, uh, you know, any remaining hair, teeth, eyelashes, eyebrows, whatever that I have. Mm -hmm. And maybe stab out both my eyeballs and eardrums if it came down to it. Not really. I really wouldn't harm myself. But I think it's a different kind of difficult because once a person passes, at least in my case, it seems to be that they become mythical. They're this perfect, mythical, larger than life creature who never said a cross word and was always the most beautiful, kindest, sweetest, considerate person on the planet. Mm -hmm. So whether or not that is true, that's, I think people tend to idealize their loved one who's passed. So, and I think especially so if it's a parent, my husband's a little bit better at keeping things realistic Mm -hmm. about that relationship and just you know, he reminds me sometimes, okay, I know what the ch- kids say to you, but it was a regular old marriage. We had up and and downs. We, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes we'd be out there fighting tooth and nail, like the outlaws or something. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't all perfect. No matter what they tell you, it was, it was just the same as anyone else's marriage. So that's, that's a good thing for me to hear because to hear not only the kids, but Oh my gosh, the in-laws. And it's furthermore interesting because my husband, he's semi-retired from pastoring at the moment, but he was a pastor. So that meant he's his wife was the pastor's wife. And so when we first started dating, I really loathed going to visit because we're in two different cities. I really loathed driving to visit him because... <laughs> People call him the mayor. It doesn't matter where you go. You can be trying to hide in the midnight movie in the corner in the dark with a ball cap on and sunglasses. And someone's going to see him and go, hey, hey, Pastor Mike. Hey, Pastor Mike. Uh (laughs) And then the first thing they do is say, oh, 
how are you? How are you doing since Miss So-and-so passed? Oh, we love her. Oh, she was this. Oh, she was that. It must be tragic. And here I'm sitting there like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Is anyone going to introduce me or look my way or? Yeah. Can you I say awkward? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really super awkward. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I'll post stuff on Facebook about my mom. And my sister will message me and she says, I don't know who you're talking about because the woman that you're representing is not the one that raised me. (laughs) (laughs) And I said, well, you don't, you know, talk bad about the dead. (laughs) Right, right. Well, no, and I I mean, and I definitely respect that. It's just a different type. I don't know any other way to explain it. It's a different type of difficult is all it is. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we're not struggling over who gets this weekend and who gets this holiday visitation and things like that, except for when it comes to the in-laws and the extended family of my husband's late wife. But so we miss out on that, but we also get to deal with all the fun stuff of the kids. Remember her perfectly, you know, every meal suddenly that she ever made was the best meal. And yeah, Not that I particularly care. I'm not overly offended by food, but it's just everything is so idealized that it's it's challenging. Over the past four and a half years, have you seen a decline in those comments? I would say a little bit of a decline. We, I never, neither myself nor my husband, discouraged them from talking about their mom and actually. They moved into our home or my husband and his children moved into the home that I owned before we were married. And I actually helped them, you know, put up some pictures of like old, you know, family pictures of family together um, that their mom was in. And I got them picture frames for some other photos that they had. So that each one could have a picture of them with their mom in their room. And it wasn't discouraged to talk about it. I think now it's not a daily comparison between, oh, Michelle does it this way. Well, our mom did it this way. And that's better because, yeah, you know, that, that's kind of mellowed down. So it, it's, it's nice. I was going to say, it's just, it's got to be so hard because you're almost competing with a ghost. Oh, I, I don't feel like it quite so much at at this stage, you know, four and a half in years married, we've been to get, well, we've dated for two years before we married. So we're, you know, we're at least in the second inning of this ball game. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We might not quite make beat a halftime yet, but we're for sure, at least in the second inning. I feel like I don't hear daily, you know, all the comparisons and I don't, feel like it every day that I'm being compared to a ghost, but it's still, it's just difficult because even when the kids do make comments like that, and I say kids like they're babies, I mean, the the youngest stepchild is 18 now, Mm -hmm. but I even felt guilty for the longest time because I felt like, oh my gosh, I can't go to my husband and say, look, this is really uncomfortable for me. I need you to do something about these constant comments. I felt like, how can you go and say that to someone about their late spouse? Right. That they were with for 18 years. You just, you know, I just thought, oh my gosh, I, that's like such sacred ground. I can't even tiptoe over there. But eventually I did, I did say, okay, I need, I need some support here. <laughs> and that's when he just laughed and laughed and said, girl, well, let me tell you that <laughs> it was not perfect. Like they seem to think so that, that was helpful. Yes, I'm sure. Now, the good thing is that you didn't move into their home. Well, yeah, I would not have wanted to, to live in, in the home. I did when we were dating, of course, I did go to the home and it was really odd just because I've, you know, he wasn't the only person that I dated after I got divorced. Mm -hmm. So I had seen other people's homes, but it's different. The vibe is different going in when someone has passed, then it's different than when there was a divorce. I think a lot of times if there's a divorce, 
uh, people are happy to change things around, you know, maybe the, like in my husband's case, he, he liked, um, ugly, like what I call man furniture. Sorry, dudes, if you're listening, (laughs) (laughs) I I don't mean to malign all of y'all, but, but you know, he like clunky guy furniture. All he cares about is, is it comfortable? It doesn't matter if it's uglier than homemade sin left out in the sun to rot as long as it's comfortable. So I think sometimes there's some good changes that come that you don't get the benefit of if it's someone passing instead of divorce, because I've, when I first actually went to his home, of course that wasn't immediate, but when I first actually, you know, went there and, and, um, I was thought to myself, Oh my good Lord, how do I know where to sit? I don't want to, you know, knowing my luck, I'll sit down and it'll be like, Oh, don't sit there. That was mom's favorite chair. We never sit there. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So I thought, Oh, sweet Lord, help me, help me. Did that ever happen? Not, not so much as sitting in the chair, but certain things like there were certain when we were trying to merge two households and I'm sure everybody can listening can relate to this is you have to get rid of certain things. I mean, everything belonging to both households will not fit. Right. And so I think that was difficult. Oh, I don't have to think. I know it was difficult because we had some protests you know, where the, the stepkids prefer to keep their items instead of coming here with, with the furniture and different things that we had. And of course they did bring some things, but I can remember the youngest one who's, who's now 18 had made a comment of, well, I, I just don't like it here because it's, it's, everything is theirs. It's their house, their rules. It's the way they do things. It's their food. It's, you know, basically it's, it's all them and none of us, I guess. So. Right. Now you've, do you have any kids of your own? I do. I have one child, um, bio son. He is now 16. He would want to say sexy 16, but I am not saying that about my child. (laughs) (laughs) Sassy, maybe 16. Yes. But he was, when we started dating, he was nine, I think. Yeah, that's about right. I think he was nine years old. And now he is a very different type of kid from my stepkids. Super, super different. And due to my background, I, (laughs) I was, according to my husband, I was very challenging to date because in my previous career and my current career to a sense, I investigated child abuse. Okay. And so I was super cautious about giving any details that I felt could reveal anything about my child because, you know, I didn't know this guy that I'm starting to date. I mean, not, not well enough that I felt I could tell him uh, how old my child was or a lot of things. So we dated for, gosh, three or four months before I, even told him if I had a boy or a girl, the only thing that I would tell was that I had a child that was old enough to go to school. That's all I would say. I had one school age child. I wouldn't say if that meant he was a kindergartner or a senior in high school. (laughs) And I, my husband told me, wow, I really didn't know what to expect because since you wouldn't tell me anything, I couldn't decide if that meant that there was something, you know, you didn't want me to know about the kid. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, yes, I don't want you to know anything about him. I don't know know you like that. So we dated about six months before I finally felt like, okay, I can tell him, you know, that I have a boy and how old he is and a few things like that. And it was still a couple more months before I let my child meet my now husband or any of this, the stepkids. So. Well, I understand with the line of work that you were in being reluctant to share information, but I would have to say that if I was dating someone and even if that they were in that kind of work, after three months or so, I'd be like, something's weird with you not telling me stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, is, that is totally what he thought. It definitely is what he thought. 
Now, I will say it's not a secret. My husband knows this, but when we first started dating, I wasn't just dating him. I oh, dating- check you out, girl. <laughs> Girl, I was keeping my options open. Yes, you were. (laughs) (laughs) You ain't stupid. (laughs) No, no, no. I wasn't going to rush right in anything. So I think he gave me a little more leeway because I'm not a two-timer. So I was very upfront about the situation and why I wouldn't give information. And I really felt like as soon as I narrow it down where I feel like, okay, this is going to move into more than social activities. <laughs> if I think it's actually going to move and And we have a joke because um, every anniversary, my, my husband, his name's Michael. He says to me, so are we going to celebrate our anniversary of being closely associated? <laughs> <laughs> because, because, I, that's how I would say, I would say, well, we're, you know, we're associated and then it kind of moved to, well, we're more closely associated and then it became friends. And then after that, it was kind of close friends. And then I was like, okay, well now we're, we're dating. Cause I just wasn't going to give up any, I wasn't going to give up any <laughs> slack. Sorry. I don't mean to mumble in Spanish. <laughs> I, I just wasn't going to just jump right in with both feet. I was like, whoa, keep the brakes on here, brother. Pump those brakes. I got to try to know what I'm getting into. Um, and guess what? Did I know what I was getting into? Nope. I did not. <laughs> no, your crystal ball was broken. <laughs> all, all of my efforts to not even say we're dating, to say we're just associates, <laughs> did not help. Because when we got married and moved in together, can I say, I'll say all heck broke loose. How's that? How about yes. that? <laughs> all heck broke loose. So, and I, um, I mean, we, I can laugh about it now. There's some things I still can't laugh about, but uh, it was not funny at the time. I thought to myself, oh my God, I don't even know. I mean, I, you can't explain if you haven't been in a blend that's going south. There's no explaining it to someone. I mean, you you try to explain what's going on and people look at you like you've got um, three heads and are speaking a, a foreign language or you're a Martian or mm-hmm. I don't know. It's, it's indescribable. It is. So how often do you have your son? Well, he lives with us full time. He, uh, he's always lived here full time. He... <laughs> so. When my ex and I got divorced, my ex had actually moved out for about two weeks before I realized he was moved out. Okay, now wait Um, a minute. (laughs) (laughs) I know it's getting real. We're about to we're about to you know sit down and pull up the chair. Now we're gonna get the tea. We're gonna gonna save some tea. (laughs) Yes, we both were very, very busy. I worked. 70 or 80 hours a week. And so did he, and he traveled a lot in his work. And so it was not unusual and he would have to travel last minute sometimes. So it would not be unusual that I would leave for work in the morning and I would come home and his suitcase would be gone and he would, you know, not be here. So I would have to text him and, or he would text me and say, Hey, I'm going to be gone for you know, I'm here, I'll be gone however many days. So yeah, it was, it was quite literally about two weeks before I was finally like, wait a minute. (laughs) Is he, is he ever coming back? Because I texted him once or twice and he was like, oh, I'm working here. So I just thought, okay, well, whatever. He never said I've left. No, no. I finally just had to, (laughs) what happened is after about two weeks is my son, who who at the time, you know, was younger, well, seven, seven, almost eight, he was just getting so upset because he wanted to talk to his poppy. And I was like, well, son, he's traveling. And he he's the one that said, you know, mommy, he's been gone for two weeks. So I actually had to go in his closet and look. And I was like, oh, my God, where's all his stuff? <laughs> 
<laughs> so then I texted him, texted him. I called him. Then finally he texted back and I was like, um, all your stuff is gone. What, what's up? And he still didn't want to say to me, I moved out. So finally I just said, did you move out? Oh, anyway. So he never, my son never really left. We stayed in our home that we had when his father and I were married and he did visitation with his dad, but he had every other weekend, but at first he didn't want to go because he didn't want to, I mean, he wanted to see his dad. He just didn't want to spend the night right? because he didn't want to sleep somewhere else. He was uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And then eventually he did work up to, to spend in the night. But the, the issue is that my ex, and I'm positive that no one who listens to this podcast is going to ever have had this situation and will never understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> but he was not regular on his schedule. So just like he used to travel for business and forget to mention it, he would just not show up and to pick up his son. And one time he, oh, I should probably have mentioned at some point that he's from a different country. My ex is from South America or Central America, technically. And so, you know, we have some some cultural differences there, too. But he once went, well, he's done it more than once at this point, but he actually went out of the country and went back to his home country and was gone for several months and didn't say, hey, I'm going or anything. <laughs> Just went. And so here's my poor son going, what's happened to my poppy? And so that that's just how it's been. It's always been sporadic like that. He's never come on time. He may say, you know, according to the court order, he's supposed to have visitation every other weekend from 7 p.m. on Friday night until 7 p.m. on Sunday night. Uh-huh. But he has never picked him up on a Friday night. And no matter what time we would arrange for him to come on Saturday and it didn't matter if it was 8 a.m. or if it was one o'clock in the afternoon, he came when he felt like it. Oh gosh. (laughs) And he didn't always keep him the allotted time. So if, and I don't know, I mean, I wasn't there, so I don't know if it was that, that my son got upset or got bored or, if it was just that my ex got a better offer and better deal them and so drop him back off. But it was very difficult for me because I couldn't really make plans to do anything, whether it was even go out to dinner with my mom or, you know, go on a date or go see friends. I could do nothing because I never knew when he was just going to show back up and drop the kid off. Right. So, and, and there were a couple of times when he, left him here and then didn't think to tell me until he had already driven away. And, you know, he would text me and I had to text him and go, I'm not there. You better get back to the house. Like now you, you just left a nine-year-old on the doorstep alone with no way to get in the house. Go, go back now. I can't, you know, where if I was an hour or two away, so too much, too much info. I am just, okay, I know he's from another country. Is that normal in his country to just leave like that and not tell the wife where you're going or your kid even? Well, I can't say it's normal in other countries. I can say for his particular culture, it's very Mm male-dominated. And basically, yes, men come and go as they please, and they don't have any child care or home responsibilities. Generally, most of the women are at home full time. So that wouldn't be something that would, they would even consider. So when we were married, all of my sister-in-laws, my ex's sisters were stay at home moms. So he didn't have, he had no frame of reference. He didn't know any women who worked. So it wouldn't have occurred to him that, oh my gosh, my wife works 70 or 80 hours a week. Maybe I can't just come and go as I want. Maybe I should make sure that someone's there. So I'm just shocked that. (laughs) (laughs) Girl, I cannot make this up. This is, you cannot make this up. This is truth is stranger than fiction. Oh my gosh. 
so how did you, what did you tell your son? Speechless. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, blah, blah. <laughs> so what did you tell your son? Oh, when the, the first time that, that my ex just left the country? Well, no, just the two week thing. Once he left and you realized he wasn't coming back. Well, I was really, it was really hard. I'm not trying to insinuate or imply that it's easy for anyone to tell their children that, you know, they're getting divorced or splitting up, but it was just difficult because there was no goodbye for my son. Yeah. It wasn't like, you know, you see on TV or, or whatever your, the counselors tell you, you know, to sit down and talk and explain that, you know, we, we love you and we're always going to love you and it's nothing you did wrong. You know, the types of things that are important to tell kids so they don't blame themselves, but he didn't get any of that. I mean, literally his dad just wasn't here anymore. Right. So I had to have the talk with him by, by myself and explain that, that his dad had moved out and that, we were getting a divorce and that it's nothing he did. And, you know, your poppy, that's what he calls his dad. Your poppy left me. He didn't leave you just because, you know, your poppy and I don't get along. Doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. You know, we're always going to be here for you. I had to have that kind of conversation with him and he was just so crushed. He just cried and cried. He was beside himself for gosh, for quite a while. He cried every day for a couple of weeks. Oh. So did you see this coming? Well, I, that's an interesting question. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I mean, logically you would say, surely you would know if things were that awful that you were going to get divorced. But I, I mean, on the one hand, I would say, I wasn't surprised at all. I was just surprised that that is how it happened. If that makes sense. I would say we were both miserable together for years, but mm -hmm. I was determined. I came from a, a family that was divorced. My mom went through many relationships and I didn't want that for my child. And I didn't have my child until I was 38 years old. So my wow. son was born when I was 38. That was purposeful. Actually, I never planned to have children, but <laughs> surprise. Yeah. So I just didn't want that for him. So I just determined, you know what, uh, no matter what it takes, as long as he's not hurting my child, it doesn't matter if I'm unhappy. Uh, what just matters is that, you know, my son has everything he needs. He's with his parents. And we did, we it wasn't the type of relationship where it was like violent and yelling and throwing things or anything mm -hmm. like that. So I just felt like it doesn't matter if I'm miserable, as long as my son has his, his family together in the house. So uh, was I shocked? No, I wasn't shocked, but I just, it wasn't in my wheelhouse that you would just move out and not tell your, your child. Yeah. I don't know any other way to phrase this, but was he <laughs> go ahead, girl, go on, go on. Was he like wimpy? Is that why he didn't tell you? Oh, no, 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 not at all. I don't want to say anything. You may have to edit this part down. Okay. <laughs> so I don't want to say anything negative culturally, but I would say this. It was more important to him to demonstrate that he was in control of me and he was going to do what he wanted. And then it was to tell our son, like it was more important to him. He knew it would hurt me more if I had to tell our son and I had to comfort him and I had to be the one to see him cry. He just what, didn't want to do douche. that. He, yeah, really, truly. <laughs> but but that's why he did, he still does things um, to this day, just to make it difficult for me. So. Oh, I can understand that, girl. <laughs> yes. I mean, what? Uh, <laughs> the list of things is, you know, uh, when you hear people talk about court hearings, I just didn't do it because I didn't want to waste. I'm not saying we didn't go to court. I mean, obviously, we, we do. We have an agreement. 
But to me, I'm just not going to fight over things. So things that he's supposed to have paid for, you know, half of this and half of that, I just didn't bother. There are very few things that I get in a tizzy about because he would rather force me to go file in court and spend thousands of dollars just so he could get the satisfaction of making me spend thousands of dollars to get the $500 in medical bills. Does that make sense? Are you sure that you and I didn't have kids from the same (laughs) man? (laughs) Well, I don't know. Is yours, is yours from Central America? (laughs) You know, no, but this is just too familiar. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's nuts. But the only thing I can say really in his, in both of our favors, if I can brag on both of us at once, is that I know we have both tried really hard not to say anything bad about the other one. And even, although at this stage at 16, you know, my son, he understands whether or not, I I don't need to tell him things like, you know, your dad's going to show up when it's convenient for him or your dad's only going to help pay for the things that he wants to help pay for. You know, my son just gets that by now. So I'll give you an example. (laughs) When I first married my husband, I had a job transfer. So we, he and his children had to leave North Carolina and they moved here to Tennessee to live with me. And then a few months later I had a job transfer. And so we had to move to a different part of Tennessee Oh gosh. Well, yes. So then there was a lot of, uh, there was just a huge bunch of financial things that happened and uh, I had to run through all my savings and I was the only one working and supporting five people unexpectedly. And the house, you know, we had a lot of house expenses for big repairs that we didn't know we were going to have. So we were paying a very expensive lease on a new house while the other house sat empty and we were dumping, I don't know, twenty dollars $25,000 into this major repair. So there was a lot going on and it was school time. And so I asked my ex to please, I said, you know, could you please just, just help me out? Even here's the list by half, buy whatever half you want. Just, you know, everything is a struggle right now. And he refused, but, but when he dropped my son off later in the afternoon, my son had a new electric guitar. Oh my gosh. So, so $30 worth of school supplies was a no, but a $300 plus electric guitar was a yes for a 10 year old. You know, that is a prime example of when their hate for you outweighs the love for their kid. Yeah. And it's horrible, but I'm not sure how we got all, you know, all down to this hole, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, we're not, like we're I've, not finished going down holes. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like I've dug us right into a, a, a big hole. Now if we can see if we can get ourselves out, but God bless my son. He's put up what he's, he's dealt with a lot in his life. And the funny thing is my husband now He, this used to drive me insane. And I literally had to learn how to nacho this, what I'm about to tell you. Cause girl, let me tell you, my ex is so charming. He is like, Mr. (laughs) He could charm the clothes right off the Pope. (laughs) He he could have the Pope, but naked riding in the Pope mobile. That's how charming he is. He's a really handsome guy, really charming. He's very courtly in his manners. And my husband, my current husband, well, he doesn't like it when I call him my current husband. He prefers to like to say my husband. Yeah. But my current husband, the final edition, let's hope, he would ask me these crazy questions because I would talk on the phone to my ex and I would be so furious. And my husband, Michael would not understand because we're talking in a foreign language. Ah. So he doesn't know what we're talking about. He just hears Spanish going on. 
And then when I get off the phone, I'm furious. And I'm like, I got to step outside. I need to go for a walk. And I come back and he's like, I don't know why are you said what happened. And I wouldn't want to go into reliving all the details. And I would just say, well, he's being really difficult about X, Y, Z. And he would just ask me all these crazy questions. And finally, I said, look, are you trying to tell me that I'm a liar and that you don't believe that how difficult he is or, or what's the problem? And then finally, what broke him of that, like my ex had the current husband convinced that he was a great guy <laughs> and that I was the one that was hard to get along with. And what finally solved that was the situation that I just told you about where, you know, we had all these huge expenses and I was the only one working and right that we needed school. So I just needed, I wasn't even asking him to buy all the school supplies, just half, take the list, get half. And he said, no, he wouldn't do that. But then he came home with the electric guitar. Then my, my husband was like, okay. And I'm like, oh, great. So you thought I was a crazy liar until now, but now <laughs> you get it. Yeah. I had a friend of mine that I had told her, you know, things that had happened with me and the ex. And she never said, I don't believe you or anything. But there was an instance where she got exposed to it. And after that, she said, I thought you were exaggerating. <laughs> and I said, really? She said, oh, yeah, but he really is a true beep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's like I said before. You cannot make that up. No, you just can't. Make, you can't make it up. I, I'm, I mean, I'm creative, but I'm not that creative. I yeah. mean, that's um, that's some um, soap opera level stuff right there. So. Yeah. And she said, "I know you well enough to know you're not going to lie." She said, "But you know, people say something happened between them and somebody, and they're like, yeah, and I told them, blah blah blah.'" She said, "I just thought you were exaggerating a little." She said. You probably toned it down. <laughs> oh yeah, because nobody people uh, nobody would believe you. Nobody would believe you. Yeah, that's why if I ever since being in this blend, well, ever since you know my experiences with my ex and now being in a blend, if a step parent would come up to me and say, "My stepkid poured gasoline all over the house and set it on fire and ripped the dogs." toenails out and made a <laughs> necklace of them and danced naked in the front yard <laughs> um and posted it all on facebook and said it's all my step you know dad or mom's fault they're horrible they made me do it i would i would i would be like whoa that, that was a rough day you had there just because you it, it, there's there's no explaining it the the, the drama the drama Yes. When we got into this blend, uh, I had seen blended relationships before because I had relatives. I had one of my aunts was divorced and she has two children and she married a man who had three daughters. So my aunt was divorced with two sons and she married a man with three daughters. And that's how they became the Brady Bunch. <laughs> da, 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 da. So I had seen, and they did not have an Alice, bless their hearts. So I had had some exposure to blends and I was very cautious. And I remember after seeing my aunt literally go into another room and cry because of the way her stepchildren were treating her on a holiday. I thought, I will never do this. Hell will freeze over. I'm never going to marry somebody with kids. I'm not going to do any of that. And then here I am. So I came in with the expectation that things were going to be hard. Well, my husband did not. Michael came in with the idea of this is going to be you know, great. And we're all going to get along and we're just going to automatically love each other. And we're going to have fun all the time. And everybody's going to be so glad to be in this family. And we're going to be the poster children for what a good blend looks like. And we thought we were prepared because we read a book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I, I read a paragraph in that Ron Deal book. We are set to go. We are good to go. So, yes, we thought we were prepared because my husband, being a pastor, he kind of, I guess, thought, oh, I've got this in my back pocket. I've counseled people. I've been a pastor. I've been married for 18 years. I've got these, you know, children of my own. I know what this is about. I'm going to, I'm just going to kill this thing. I have got it. And then I, I suggested, well, maybe we got to do a little preparation. So we agreed that we would read a, can I say the name of the book? Yeah. Okay. It was the Ron Deal book about step families. What is it? Oh, there's nine of them. The smart step mom, the smart, the smart, step- the smart step family. Okay. That's what it is. So we each got a copy. That's what we were agreed is that we would each get a copy of the, of this book and we would read it and then we would kind of talk about it. Well, we each got a copy because I bought one for each of us and at least one of us read the book. <laughs> <laughs> let me guess which one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to let you guess, Lori, and if you can't guess, it's me. I'll tell you, it's me, it's me, I'm the one of us. So we tried to talk about it a couple times and overly notice it because he would kind of steer the conversation into different family things. But after we had actually moved in, got married, moved in together, I realized, dang it, he didn't even read that book. And he he did admit to me, he's like, well, I started to read it. But then I figured, well, I probably already know all this stuff. I was married for 18 years. How different can it be? <laughs> <laughs> you oh. showed him. <laughs> yes, there's right. Yeah, yeah. This blend kicked all of our butts and showed us all. So mm-hmm. we, yeah, so we, we both erroneously thought that we were incredibly prepared because, you know, we're two college educated, well-traveled individuals of at least moderate intelligence. You know, we can tie our own shoes and so forth and find our way out of the house every day. And uh, at least recently, none of us have gone to work without our pants on or whatever. (laughs) So we were like, Oh, we got this. We don't, we gonna nail this. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I was a little bit suspect that it would be a little harder than that. I expected the kids weren't going to always be thrilled and be like, oh, I love you, stepmommy. You're the best stepmommy in the world. (laughs) Receive my love. (laughs) (laughs) What can I do for you today, stepmommy? How can I help you with chores? I didn't think it was going to quite be like that, but my husband definitely did think it was going to be like that. So we had a rude awakening. (laughs) And him more so than you. Oh my gosh. Yes. Because, and I I have to get a laugh sometimes when I read things in the, either the Facebook group or in the Academy or different things. When people talk about, Oh, my partner has my significant other, whoever it is, has guilty parent syndrome because and their example is something like, well, because their kid left their wet towel on the floor And I thought they should lose their Nintendo for a week. And (laughs) they just told them to, you know, go pick up the towel and not to do it again. And, you know, they're going on about how they're just tormented. And I'm not saying that wouldn't be irritating. Right. Nobody wants your, you know, your fancy towel moldy and nasty. And I'm sure it's irritating. But, you know, in our case, it was things like the stepkid stealing cars. And sneaking out of the house in all (laughs) hours of the day and breaking into a home and coming home drunk and the older stepkid buying alcohol and other substances for the younger stepkid and their friends. I mean, we're, we're talking about a completely different level of tragedy you know I wouldn't say tragedy completely different level of guilty parenting so well now you've got to admit you know what they say about (laughs) preachers kids oh yeah oh for sure (laughs) oh for sure and here here's the funny part is that when we were dating these kids were so polite you would not have known there was only one incident where something happened and I got a little tiny glimpse 
with the older stepchild where he got in trouble and, and they called, you know, it was at a football game. And I happened to be there visiting my husband on a date and the, the police called <laughs> and said, <laughs> uh, sir, we need you to come get your son. Uh, uh, there's an in- incident at the football game, the high school football game. So, but I didn't really think anything about it because I wasn't on the phone. So I didn't get details. So for all I know, they were toilet paper and something, you know, doing some prank like that. But that was really all I saw of the, I don't even know what to call it. Like the utter ridiculousness of what was about to befall me. If you would have told me, oh, that sweet little blonde boy that looks like an Abercrombie and Fitch model with that million dollar grin that makes grannies just want to pinch his cheeks and, you know, hand over their wallets. That sweet little boy that's on video preaching on YouTube because he did used to do that. One of my stepsons, he was adorable. And, you know, that sweetheart right there that brings home the sick and injured animals is going to steal three different cars and wreck one and threaten to run away and actually run away because your husband won't divorce you. I mean, if you would have told me any of that, I would have been like, you are on, get off the drugs, (laughs) put them drugs down. We going to intervene. Do you need prayer? Do you need girl? Tell me what you need because you are vastly confused. You must be on something. Right. You could not have convinced me. Wow. You could not have convinced me that all that would happen and that my husband, the father, would just say, now, son, I just want to encourage you (laughs) to, you know, make better decisions because you're hurting yourself. And I'm over here going, oh, sweet Lord Jesus, help (laughs) me strike me dead, strike (laughs) me dead, because if you don't strike me dead... Um, we'll need bail money right now because I'm about to come off of here out this chair. And first I'm going for my husband. And once I rip every hair out of his head, I'm going to pounce on my stepkid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because you do not wake me up at three o'clock in the morning by the police calling <laughs> for me to have to come get you out of the back of the police car. Yeah. And then the punishment is, I just want to encourage you to make better decisions. <laughs> I just thought, oh my God, oh my God. And so that's all that's what drove me to to find the Nacho Kids, Lori. Well, I am so glad you did because <laughs> you obviously needed it. <laughs> I can't I can't even, Lori. I can't if I even told you, your the listeners would not believe it if I said everything. They would not believe me. Well, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking. You know, I see it all the time, and you see it, like you said, the stepmoms say, oh, little Johnny did whatever, and his iPad should be taken away for two days. Well, what they don't realize is their sweet little baby boy is going to do something later in life, and they're not going to hold their own bio child to those same level of consequences. Well, now, in my case, I will say that my husband actually tells me He's like, okay, you've got to settle down. You're too hard on him. You're too, because I just don't, I <laughs> definitely sorry. believe I in, just... I, you can see it. <laughs> Especially when he's, you know, the son gets arrested and he's like, we need to talk about some stuff. And I can see you telling your son, I'm going to tear your tail up. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, please. It, yeah. So the, the difference is my, my child brings home a, a B on a test. And I'm like, Oh no, Oh no, 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 no. This is not going to fly. You know, you're spending too much time writing music or playing games or whatever. We're not going to have this. Your academics are first, blah, blah, blah. And then my son gets mad at me and I'm like, dude, you can be mad all you want, but if you cut them eyes at me one more time, (laughs) you know, you're going to be picking your eyes up off the ground. Because I'm not having that. You can be as mad and pout and whatever. It's not going to affect me at all. That's not going to change your punishment. And if you don't straighten up, um, you're going to buy yourself some more punishment because there's no need in that. That's where I come from. (laughs) So, so of course, as always happens in blended land. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you don't have guilty parent syndrome? 
I would say, yes, I do, but I don't have it. It doesn't bother me to have standards and behavior, standards and grades. It doesn't bother me to give out consequences and to hold to them. None of that bothers me. What gets me is that sometimes I just think to myself, oh my gosh, my poor son has had to go through this blended family and live through this craziness and have his parents be divorced. And it's because of me. Like I have guilt. If we divided my guilt into a seven slice pizza, my guilty (laughs) parent syndrome, two slices have to do with my, my poor baby boy comes from a broken home. And will he ever recover? (laughs) And then, um, the remaining five slices of the guilty parent pie, pizza pie, uh, supreme, <laughs> all those are all about the blend because it has been so, it's just been a shock for all of us. But, you know, my, for my son, he's been the only child until now. Mm-hmm. He never witnessed siblings fighting, like physically fighting or arguing or shouting at each other because he's an only child. Right. He, so he didn't witness that. And that is, that's one of my hard boundaries is I don't stay in any relationship where someone is going to curse at me, call me names, me or my child, obviously. Oh yeah. Or, you know, be physical, break things, be threatening. Any, any of that is a no for me. Well, when you grew up with brothers or even other siblings, you're going to have a certain amount of give me back my shoes or that's my video game or why are you on my cell phone? Oh, you broke yours. That doesn't mean you can use mine. You know, now we're wrestling around and breaking the living room furniture. He never had some of that's normal and he never had any of that. So he went from kind of a, a really easy peasy life to being thrown into this real tumultuous blend and, He was watching me struggle a lot. He was very happy at first because he was excited to have the brothers. At first, he didn't want me to get remarried because he didn't want to share me. Mm -hmm. But then as soon as he realized he was getting these older brothers that he thinks are the coolest thing since uh, Buttonfly Levi's, (laughs) he, (laughs) let me tell you, let me tell you, he, he was all for that. Um, Now, they weren't too thrilled about him because he was this like weird little nerdy kid. Uh And they were like these, uh, you know, kind of jock type of kid. I don't know if people know. Like they were real into sports and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's not that he isn't into sports. He played some sports when he was younger, but he's a totally different kid. And so my guilt comes the five slices of the guilt pizza pie are for <laughs> my my poor perfect baby who's never done anything wrong in his life uh-huh having to suddenly have siblings that throw things and yell and leave dirty clothes everywhere and and pick on him yes and pick on him and make fun of him and that was a difficulty too in the in the beginning so but you know Uh, Sometimes I hear people with their comments and whatnot and asking for, you know, nacho advice and they'll say things like, I'm not going to, you know, my stepkid hit my kid. And, and I mean, I, I understand you can't have a 15 year old picking up the baseball bat and beating the toddler down. Right. This isn't a Jerry Springer show over (laughs) here or why, uh, what is it? WWE or whatnot. We're Mm -hmm. not. We're not having that, but at the same time, they're going to be kids. They're going to have disagreements. They're going to argue over stuff. And so that was, a. Uh, it was hard for me to learn how to separate, okay, this is normal between siblings, between three brothers, because mm-hmm. that's what ended up being in the house. And this is blended family stuff, because I think a lot of things that as step parents, we try to say is a blended family issue is not a blended family issue. It's just a family issue. It's just people living in the same house and siblings. And I think I see that too with marriages a lot of times or relationships. It doesn't have to be a marriage, but sometimes people are, are saying, this is my situation I need help with. And I'm thinking to myself, 
Oh, Lord, sweet Jesus, sis. Let me, let, I'll help. I'll, I'll give you nacho advice, but this is a relationship problem. This is not, <laughs> this yeah. is not a stepkid problem. Yes. This is a, this is a, I don't know how you got in this relationship that you're in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but girl, I feel you. Uh, you know, uh, but who? Yeah, I don't think you can fix that. <laughs> you know, a lot of times I think they are normal relationship issues, but the fact that it's a blend just intensifies to the people the severity of it, or it intensifies the emotion. Oh, I a hundred percent, a hundred percent agree. And one of the things that I remember saying to my husband, and I still say it sometimes, uh, but now we can joke about it. But back then it wasn't a joke, but, um, or, you know, it wasn't anything to joke about. But, right. Oh, we joke about all kinds of stuff now that was not funny back in the day. Oh, for, for sure. For sure. But one of the things is that certain things would happen and I would say to him, I'm going to need you to do something about that. Like if things the kids would do, for example, buy stuff on Amazon using our, our debit or credit card. (laughs) What else? Take money out of our bank account. Just all different types of things. Steal. I hate to use the word steal. Take without permission. (laughs) Yes. Take, take things, car keys and alcohol, you know, bottle of wine or, or whatever it might be. And I would say like, I I need you to do something about this. I mean, from my background, you know, it's, it's highly influenced by law enforcement. So what we call this is a crime (laughs) (laughs) and and I'm going to actually need you to do something about the crime. Okay. (laughs) I mean, I can overlook, um, I was not doing before I knew what not doing was a little bit, a certain amount of their like little snot, sly, snotty little comments because I've been a teenager, you know, I maybe not have been in a step parent before, but I've been a teenager and I know sometimes good Lord, you know, you might let something slip out and think to yourself, Ooh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> I was thinking that, did I just say that? I don't know. Did I? So I could overlook and I was kind of letting that kind of stuff go by, but now out and out theft and whatnot, I'm going to need you to do something about that. And one time, <laughs> one time when it was something had gone missing, let me just say that. And I said, well, I'm going to need you to do something about this. And the guilty parent, you know, reaction was, well, I'll talk to him. It's not such a big idea. And so what I finally said was, if this was the neighbor kid who came in my bedroom, if the neighbor kid, the neighbor teenage boy came in your wife's bedroom without her permission and took this. Would that be your same reaction? Right. And so that that finally got like a little bit more of, oh, okay, no, maybe not. And now we joke around. I can remember trying to explain to, <laughs> now these are close friends, Lori, close friends, okay? <laughs> okay. I'm going to say these are like my sister friends, okay? These, these are people that knew me back in the day when we all had feathered hair and wore Jordache jeans. Okay. That's those <laughs> type of friends. Yeah. You know, they remember when we all went to the skating rink. So that that's the level of friendship I'm going to tell you, but uh-huh. <laughs> I was trying to explain to those type of friends who I call my tribe. Shout out tribe. You'll probably never listen to this, but I was trying to explain to them what it's like to be in a blend because none of them have been in a blend. And I was trying to explain like the difficulties and they're all looking at me like, are you speaking in Spanish? Because I do not understand the words coming out of your mouth. And so finally I said, look, have you ever had a a little broke roommate, the worst roommate ever that's done moved in your house and they won't clean up after themselves. They invite their friends over all the time. They eat all your food. They throw big parties. And leave everything a hot mess. And then they they never have their share of the rent or the bills. And they come in your room and take your clothes. And and you ever have those kind of people? And they're like, oh, yeah, I had one of those roommates before. Okay, welcome to having stepkids. There you go. <laughs> That's exactly it. It's your, it's your, little, your little broke roommates 
<laughs> well, broke terrible roommates. That's what you got. <laughs> and you can't get them out the house because they got a they got a lease. Yes. So you've got the stepson that's twenty four and the stepson eighteen that are both living with you. Mm-hmm. The eighteen year old is a senior in high school. Okay. What about the twenty four year old? How do you handle an older stepchild living in your home? Do we need to make this part two of the Michelle podcast? <laughs> Okay, Mustang Sally and Ride Sally Ride are two different songs. Okay, and and everybody held on through the entire in- first half of this interview to find that out. I know. <laughs> Th- thank y'all for your patience. But y'all know what? What? This reminded me of something. We used to always go to Columbia every other weekend to see my grandmother. Now, please date this. It wasn't like yesterday. It's like when you were a kid. Yeah. Okay, so you date date the conversation here. Okay, back in 1979. Okay. Probably 80, early 80s. Anyway, we all get in the station wagon or the big blue moose car that we had. This is the one where you sit in the back facing the opposite direction? Well, you could, yeah. But back then, you didn't really have to wear seatbelts, so sometimes we laid down the whole back and just made it like a bed. Mm Mm-hmm. But there were three of us, so we would fight over who got the back. And, of course, if I rode in the back and we got in front of a tractor-trailer truck, I'd do that honking thing. (laughs) You can say my daddy get mad because he's like, that darn truck keeps honking at me. (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) So, actually, it was the big blue moose that this happened in. And I still can't remember the name of that car. I'll have to find out. Not that y'all care. But it was a big blue moose. It had, like, velvet seats. Oh, it was nice. You could have a party in that car. Well, I'm singing, the radio's on, and this song came on, Lay Down Sally. Okay. I don't, who sings that song, David? Uh, Eddie Rabbit. I don't know. No. It says Eric Clapton. Yeah, actually, that's right. He Is sang country? Eric Clapton? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, anyway, whoever sang it. Eric Clapton, that's right. Yeah, but it was on the country radio station. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so I'm singing, lay down, Sally. And all of a sudden, pap, slap to the face. Don't you sing that song. And I'm so confused. I didn't even know what I was singing. Who hit you? My mama. (laughs) So your mama backhanded you in the back seat. Uh Uh-huh. Because you were singing songs that they were playing on the radio. Yep. (laughs) That you had no idea what the song meant. Yep. Apparently they did and still played it on the radio. (laughs) Yeah. So I don't understand. Hmm. Yeah. It's funny the songs that parents play that their kids learn to sing. And then they get mad because the kids sing them. Yeah. Because they're inappropriate. I remember singing, it's a fine time to leave me Lucille. It's a fine time (laughs) to leave me Lucille. (laughs) I like that song, too. But, you know, no, my mom and my daddy riding in this big blue moose, me and my two sisters, with their windows rolled up, smoking their Salem's. And I started singing Lay Down Sally. No, my mama and my daddy. Oh, so you jump in the story, so it makes it sound like everybody's smoking cigarettes in there. Well, Courtney probably was. Don was probably smoking weed, but that's a whole nother discussion. Courtney's like, okay, they light, they lit up. Let's light up now. They'll, they won't be able to tell the difference in the smoke. <laughs> They'll never know. Yeah. And then you're sitting there back there going, there, there, Sally. Yeah. <laughs> I don't we understand. don't care. We don't care if Courtney's smoking, but you ain't singing that song. <laughs> <laughs> that's like that time I told on Don for smoking and I got a whooping for being a tattletale. <laughs> and Don didn't get in trouble at all. Makes perfect sense. They didn't know what to do with Dawn. They were just like, whatever. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people said that about Dawn. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so that's my story about Lay Down Sally. Sorry, Sally. But I'm welcome to you, the Sally Academy. Sally don't care. Yeah, welcome to the Academy, Sally. <laughs> and just know if you join a QA coaching call, I will sing for you. So next week we'll announce another winner and make up songs about them. I hope they got a good name. <laughs> Because, <laughs> like, your name's not a good name. What do you mean my name's not a good name? How many songs or words even rhyme with David? I don't know. 
That too bad your name ain't Rick, because we could talk about Rick rolling again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks. Oh, Lordy, have mercy. We are so glad that you stuck out to the end of this. And we look forward to next week when we share part two of Michelle's story. Yep, we will. But until then, remember, life is good. When you nacho. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nacho Kids podcast. Find us online at nachokids.com. Until next time, remember, life is good when you nacho.